Hi, my name is Sierra Moody, and I'm the driver trainer at Baltimore County Public Schools. And welcome to our alternative driver training class. These are we cover some of the topics to give you an overview of some of the things that you'll experience while you're out on the road transporting our students. So here's some of the topics that we'll cover. We have defensive driving, driver fatigue, some accident procedures, behaviors, child abuse and sexual harassment, disability information, first aid, and of course our behind the wheel certification. So the mission of Office of Transportation is to provide safe and efficient school transportation services in an environment that fosters positive social interaction and allows students to be successful learners. So the most important thing about the mission statement is that we want you to provide safe and efficient transportation services for our students because there are a lot of things that go, out that go on out there on the road and we just want them to get to and from school as safely as possible. So if you don't know, but Baltimore County is the 25th largest school district. Um, we have 11 bus lots and we transport just about 84,000 students per day and about four, a little over 4,000 of those students are special needs, okay? So, so this is a little breakdown of the last the areas that we cover. Southwest, we have two bus lots there, Arbutus and Enwood. The Northwest area, there are another set of two bus lots which are Windsor Mill, Wabash. Central, Cockeysville, Providence, Parkton. Northeast area, there's Kenwood and Rosedale. The Southeast area is North Point and Hopkins Creek. So we have policy 4100 is employee conduct. So employees play a critical role in maintaining the image of the school system. Every employee must model ethical behavior, exhibit a strong work ethic, work productively and perform his or her duties in a professional manner. Employees are expected to maintain a standard of dress, personal appearance, and general decorum, as well as moral standards and behavior that reflect their professional status in the community. So just remember when you're out there on the road, when you're transporting our students, you are a professional. And we want you to display that in all means of communication, dealing with the parents, the administrators, teachers, or whomever that may be, because you are a representation of Baltimore County. So we get in terms of pre-trip, we talk about the being personal and your vehicle. So what we mean by this is a pre-trip is do you do a personal pre-trip of yourself before you start your day in the morning? So what are some things that you do as you start your day in the morning? Yes. I have my coffee. Do so you have your coffee? Um, I make my lunch. Make your lunch. Take my shower. Take your shower. And all of these things are to prepare you for what? For a great day. Yes. Then what happens if you don't do those things? You feel off. We start to rush. Feel like you forgot something. Okay, and then that's just a train reaction, right? So what about a pre-trip of your vehicle? When you get out in the morning to get started on your day, do you check your vehicle? I should. For what kind of things are you looking for? For the taillights out, maybe headlights out, your blinker's not working. What about if you have enough fuel for your trip? You don't get it the morning of? I hope not. <laughs> Yes, yes, because myself included is some of the things that happens that you know the night before that you should go ahead and fill your vehicle up. So you're ready for the day ahead. But what do you do? I'll do it in the morning. And what happens? You get out there, you're late leaving the house. Now you still have to go and fill it up, but now you're even later for what's ahead of you, right? Press snooze on your alarm <laughs> and realize too late. Yes. So some of these things you just got to be mindful of. Do a personal pre-trip of yourself in the morning. Think about how you're feeling. 
As your vehicle prepare for the road, what's coming ahead of you, there may be traffic delays, but mentally you need to be there in the present. So what are some things that you can control? Even though those things may come up, the traffic, maybe you're running late, what can you control yourself? What can you control? Your breathing, mm -hmm. the way you react to things. Anything else? Your attitude. Oh, most definitely. Most definitely your attitude. Is your attitude could be positive or negative when you're driving when you're driving down the road and you see that construction and it says road closure what happens yes and could that affect your driving oh yeah make you more aggressive absolutely absolutely you're right so these are some of the things that you can control your attitude your actions and your reactions, okay? So when we talk in terms of defensive driving, we kind of talked about your attitude and your actions and reactions. How do you think that relates to defensive driving? You may not be as aware. You're thinking about other things versus your surroundings. Absolutely. You're thinking about the safety of the students. You're thinking about Yes. So when you're out there traveling, dri driving down the road, what are what are some of the things that you're looking out for? Not just your driving, but other people's driving. Yes. Right. Pedestrians. Yes. Debris in the roadway. Yes. Broken down vehicles. All of those things are a factor. So basically, a defensive driver is one who commits no driving errors and makes allowances for the lack of skills or improper driving practices of others. A defensive driver adjusts his or her own driving to compensate for unusual weather, road, and traffic conditions, and is not tricked into an accident by the unsafe action of the pedestrians and other drivers. By being alert to accident-inducing situations, the defensive driver recognizes the need for preventive action in advance and takes the necessary precautions to prevent the accident. A defensive driver knows when it is necessary to slow down, stop, or yield the right away to, involve, to avoid involvement in an accident. So when you're transporting the students, you're on the way to the school. Everybody, their parents, you have uh, school buses, all kinds of vehicles in the school zone trying to do what? Yes, or pick them up, but everybody's everywhere, okay? So what are some things that you would do to avoid a situation at the schools? Slowing down. Slow down, make sure that you get there on time or beforehand. Yes. Mainly being a cautious driver in those school loading zones. And because you have students running, maybe they forgot something, just different things that could be a factor that would or may turn into a bad situation, right? So distracted driving, what is he doing? Cell phone. Which many of us have, right? But while we're transporting our students, are we gonna have the cell phones in our hand? Could you have the cell phone out? I'm not supposed to. Because what? Hmm. So what usually happens when you have your cell phone right there in the cup holder or somewhere at your disposal? What are you more than likely about to do when it rings or dings or whatever? So if you take your eyes off of the road for a split second, what could happen? Anything. Anything. And you're transporting our precious children. Okay? So we, want, we don't want to fall into that category. So what are three different types of distracted driving? Give you a hint. The visual, we just talked about the cell phones. 
taking your eyes off the road, right? What about when you have passengers in the back? Oh, um, audio. Audio as well. You're absolutely right. So maybe your music is too loud? Maybe our students are too loud. That too. <laughs> so what about the mental aspect? Do you daydream? Say yes. Yes. <laughs> so you're ever driving home and you are... You left work, but then when you realize it, you're home. So do you remember the ride all the way there from work to home? You're daydreaming about what? What do you guys do when I get home? Yes. Different things like that. But how does that affect your driving? It's distracted. It's a danger. Mm -hmm. But it happens to the best of us, right? So what are some things that you can do to avoid that type of thing? Um, just try to stay focused on driving and don't worry about what you have to do until you get home. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> yes, that's important. Yep. Are we driving like this? Sometimes. Yeah. When you see the car in front of you swerving in and out of the lane, the first thing you're thinking is what? They're on the phone. Depends what time of day it is, though. That, too. You know? Yes. Are they That's a scary thought. So is there anything you could do with that? You're behind them and you notice that's going on? Back off a little bit. Yeah. Give them more space. Absolutely. So we kind of touched base with this already. So driver fatigue, what time of the day does our physical and mental functions decrease and make us more tired? So after you finish your long day of work, are you tired? Yes. What about early in the morning? Are you an early morning riser? Of course we are. <laughs> <laughs> to some of those people who aren't, you know, they adjust accordingly. That's the main thing. So knowing who you are, let's just talk, back it up and talk about if you have a route or once you get your route for your students, you know that you are to leave out of your house or location 630, okay? And you are to be at the destination by 7. So if even if you're not a morning person, there are some things that you're going to do way ahead of time to prepare yourself for that 630, you know, exit time. Right? You're not going to just stay up late the night before as if you don't have anything else to do that morning. And then you're rushing. Now you're tired and trying to make the 6.30 time that you leave out of your house. Does that affect the whole goal of what we started off for our mission? Yes. Because what's our mission? To provide safe. Yes, for our students, okay? So we're talking about time again. So are you the type that, are, that is always on time? S say yes. Yes. <laughs> so if you're late starting a route, what do you do? You just stay yeah, late. Yes. Stay late. Because if you speed, then you're not thinking about the safety of our students. Absolutely, okay? And do you really save time when you're speeding? In and out of traffic. Not really. You just create more of a situation for you and everyone else around you. Yes. And what about your attitude at that point? Oh, you oh, get yeah. so much more frustrated that way. Absolutely. Okay. So sometimes you don't know about the different traffic things that are going on. Maybe there's an accident. The weather has changed. And road closures. Okay. But giving yourself a lot of time to prepare for those types of things, you could avoid that. Okay. So we kind of touched base about the speed because this is very important. Because again, we're providing safe and efficient transportation for our students. Okay? So are we going to obey the speed limit? Yes. Yes. Okay, so the video that we're about to watch, it's something that we show our bus drivers, but 
it is very relatable to vehicles being on the road, okay? Oof, look at that rain. I don't know where you live, but here it's been one of those seasons where it just won't stop. But because you drive a bus, you have to deal with adverse weather sometimes. Snow, rain, sleet, fog. Just like the Postal Service, it can't deter you from your appointed rounds. You gotta know what you're up against and be prepared. In this program, we're gonna talk about the different kinds of driving conditions you could face and how to adapt to them and keep yourself and your passengers safe. But first, let's deal with the misconception. Bad weather does not cause accidents. But I read in the news that a snowstorm in New York caused a pileup. Sorry, but that's not true. If a snowstorm could cause a pileup, then there'd be a pileup every time there was a snowstorm. No. Drivers reacting to the snowstorm caused the pileup, not the snowstorm. And you don't just run into one, like turning a corner. The increasing white flakes falling all around you should be enough to indicate a need to slow down and pull back. Overconfidence in bad weather causes accidents. The goal is to remove or reduce risk. And since bad weather can increase the risks, using the defensive driving techniques of Triple LC will show you how to react and how to keep weather from increasing your risks. What are some special weather conditions you might encounter while you're out there on the road? And how would you respond to them? Uh, rain. Mm -hmm. Rain. Uh, snow. Snow. Ice. And ice. So how would you respond to those? Um, I, I would slow down. Yes. And sometimes you can check the weather before you head out, right? Would that help? It would help you be more prepared. Absolutely. Let's start with today's weather. Rain is by far the most common adverse weather condition you'll encounter. Sure, it looks harmless enough, but rain reduces your traction up to 55%. Reduced traction means it's a lot easier to skid, fishtail, or hydroplane, which can all lead to an accident. So slow down and leave more room. You should cut your speed by at least 25%. So if the speed limit is 40 miles per hour, you have to reduce your speed to 30. 25%, that's like one-fourth, right? Anyway, even if I reduce my speed, the roads can still be slippery in the rain. So what should I do if I skid? React calmly. Gently turn the wheel into the direction of the skid and ease off the brake and accelerator. And watch out for wet brake. That's when your brakes get wet from driving in heavy rain or through deep standing water. Wet brakes might pull to one side or they might not work at all. Gently push down and pump your brakes until you feel the normal resistance. And even if you don't get wet brake, be sure to leave yourself plenty of room to stop gradually anytime it's raining. Last year, I rear-ended a car ahead of me. It happened during the heaviest rainstorm in Georgia in 40 years. Surely the rain caused this accident. Wow, the heaviest rainfall in 40 years. Were there thousands of rear-end collisions all around you or all over the state? Well, no, I only know about my accident. But if the rain caused the accident, then surely every car would have rear-ended the car in front of them. They would all have crashed. It was how you reacted to the rain that caused your accident. I'm afraid you were at fault. You should have slowed down and left more room. Did you not know it was raining? Yeah. Yeah. I guess it was my fault. Speaking of leaving room, in the rain you'll need to increase your following distance to at least five seconds to prevent any wet collisions. Reduced traction means it takes longer for you to stop. That extra second in your following distance gives you the room you need. And never use cruise control in the rain. If you leave more room, you will reduce the risk. As an added precaution, you may have local rules or regulations that require you to keep your headlights on at all times. But if you don't, be sure they're on whenever you need your windshield wipers. Even a slight mist, snow flurries, fog, or light rain will limit everyone's visibility. 
Turn on your light so the other guy can see you, and make sure you can see as well. Use both your windshield wipers and the defroster to clear away rain and condensation that can build up on your windshield. And do you know what happens when it rains in dry or desert-like places? Um, I suppose a bunch of rain falling on top of flat, dry ground would cause some flooding. That's exactly right. In dry and desert areas, the ground doesn't absorb water very well. Everything flows to low areas and starts to build up, causing flash floods. And sometimes that water can move very fast and be very deep. So never attempt to cross standing or running water. If there are flooding conditions, your supervisor or dispatcher should let you know if there are any known detours. And last but not least, when you're approaching a bus stop in the rain, always slow down early so you don't splash pedestrians and passengers waiting to get on. Why should you slow down early when approaching, um, let's just say a traffic light in the rain? You don't want to skid. You don't want to skid. You don't want to hydroplane. You're hydroplane. Give yourself a chance to stop. Yeah, give yourself a chance to stop. And sometimes when you're driving in the rain in those puddles, do we know how deep those puddles are? No. Just got to be careful. In the rain, if the speed limit is 60 miles per hour, you have to reduce your speed to? 45. 45? Yes. Correct. Snow is not the same as rain. It's worse. The good news is that when snow accumulates on the road, the transportation department works hard and helps out. They plow and lay down salt and sand. They set up detours around impassable roads. Even with all their preventative measures, snow reduces your traction up to 75%, which will greatly increase the likelihood of sliding or getting into an accident. You'll need to be sure you accelerate slowly and brake gradually to maintain control and avoid sliding, and never use cruise control. To avoid running into the cars in front of you, increase your following distance to at least six seconds. You'll need the extra distance because it'll take you longer to stop. You must reduce your speed by 50%. Cut it in half. So if the speed limit's 40 miles per hour, how fast should you go in the snow? I would go a maximum of 20 miles an hour and make sure my following distance is six seconds. Yes, and just like in the rain, you want to use both your windshield wipers and the defroster to clear snow and fog off your windshield. Of course, there's always the possibility that snow will turn into freezing rain. Oh yeah, how's freezing rain going to affect my traction? Ice and sleet are very dangerous to drive in. Your traction is reduced by 85 to 95 percent, and sometimes you don't even get that much. You need to take extra, extra, extra caution to accelerate slowly and brake very gradually. And you'll need to increase your following distance to at least seven seconds to accommodate the extra distance that's required to stop. You need to slow down enough to stop safely within your following distance. In the ice, that's reducing your speed by 66 percent. That's two-thirds, meaning if the speed limit's 60, you go 20. And once again, you need the most visibility you can get, so use the defroster and your wipers. In the ice and snow, if you start to skid, gently turn the wheel into the skid, which is normally the direction you want the bus to go. Ease your foot off the accelerator and do not use the brakes until you're straightened out. When you do, use the brakes gently and don't panic the bus will eventually come out of the skid. If the wheels lock up and you start to slide, come off and then back on the brakes so the wheels start to turn and pump the brakes. This will stop you sooner than continuing to skid. There are a number of other potential hazards from snow. First, your visibility may be reduced by wheel spray. This will be reduced if you stay back at least six seconds and do not drive at the rear and side of other vehicles. Avoid this spray. Second, the bus wheels may be pulled to one side by slush or snow that is deeper on the one side than the other. Be prepared for this and compensate for it by holding the steering wheel firmly. Third, 
There will be snow plows out and about and you need to stay clear of them. Never overtake a snow plow. Stay well behind it at least six seconds to avoid any spray. Fourth, often snow will build up in the center of your lane as the wheels clear it on either side. This becomes a problem when you have to drive across it to change lanes or turn. Slow down and cross it slowly as it will pull your wheels to one side. Fifth, blowing snow and snow blindness can restrict your vision. Slow down and if the visibility is really bad, stop in a safe place and wait until it clears up. Finally, be careful if driving in the dark with large snowflakes falling. They can really distort your view. Even worse than snow is ice, especially black ice. Bridges freeze before the road, so watch out for this and allow for it. Slow down for bridges and try not to brake as you cross bridges and do not change direction. Remember, bad weather doesn't cause accidents. People do. In safety best practices, we defined accidents as unplanned events that disrupt activity, involve or affect people, and are caused. Don't take risks. Adjust to the special weather conditions by slowing down and leaving more space. And never use the engine retarder or engine brake in adverse weather. Ice and sleet reduce your traction by 85 to 95%. So why do we say bad weather doesn't cause accidents? People do. Because people don't go in prepared. Who's in control of the vehicle? We are. Yes. Yeah. So what does the weather have to do with the accident? So it's, is it by the way people react to the weather? Absolutely. The situation they're in? Yes. And remember we talked about earlier, we said that you are in, in control of your attitude, your actions, and your reactions, right? Other adverse conditions include heavy fog, dust, and smoke, each of which can drastically reduce your ability to see in a matter of seconds. Fog is actually the worst condition of all. If you can't see at least two seconds in front of you, even at slow speeds, then you need to pull over and stop. A common mistake amateur drivers make is to turn on their high beams in fog. That makes everything worse because the lights reflect off the fog, dust, or smoke and create glare. Well then, what's the best way to handle glare on the road? The best way to handle glare or other limited visibility conditions is to watch the lane markings and make sure you stick with your low beams. And if an oncoming driver uses their high beams, it's even more important to check your position on the road by looking at the lane markings. You can also use the vehicle in front of you to anticipate the road ahead, especially their taillights. Of course, you have to check to make sure that the vehicle's position is within the lane markings. You don't want to unknowingly follow them right off the road. And remember, it's all too easy to overdrive your sight lines in heavy fog, dust, or smoke. If your sight distance is only two seconds or less, safely pull off the road and wait until conditions improve. No exceptions. If you do have to pull off, make sure you find a safe area such as a rest area or a road leading off the main highway. And be sure to turn on your emergency flashers. Keep in mind that it's not safe to just move to the side of the road because the shoulder may not be strong enough to support the bus. Another weather condition you'll have to deal with when you drive through certain areas or during unseasonably high temperatures is extreme heat, which is very hard on your bus. So here's what you can do to help maintain your vehicle when it gets hot. Use the fast idle to cool the engine when you're sitting at long stops or long red lights or anywhere for less than 10 minutes. You should also use low gears when traveling at speeds of less than 40 miles per hour during the hot part of the day. You can also turn off your engine retarder system when the temperature is above 110 degrees. And finally, you should use your air conditioner. The air conditioner will cool the ambient temperature by approximately 20 degrees. Be sure to keep all windows and vents closed and always turn on your air conditioner before the fast idle. Never turn off the air conditioner thinking you'll get more power. Besides keeping your bus cool, it's important to try and keep yourself and your passengers from becoming overheated as well.
Let's see. Neither snow, nor rain, nor sleet, nor... Oh, yeah. What about dark of night? Yes, the darkness of night and the brightness of light are both issues that affect our visibility. You can't drive safely if you can't see. And it's all a question of light, or the lack of it. You see, light and dark can restrict your vision in three ways. First, there can be too much light, such as when you drive into the sun or toward oncoming headlights at night. You can also get too much light in your eyes from reflected glare. Then there's the opposite, too little light, like when you're driving at night or through a tunnel or through fog or smoke, like we talked about earlier. Finally, it might be a combination of too much and too little light. This happens when you drive from a brightly lit area into a dark area. Like leaving a brightly lit parking lot to a dark street at night or entering a tunnel on a sunny day. What about that oncoming car with his brights on? Yes, that's another example of combination light. But what are you supposed to do about it? You can't really control this stuff. While it's true that you can't control it, there are things you can do to be safe in these conditions. Don't look directly into light sources, especially oncoming headlights or the sun. Wear dark, polarized sunglasses when it's bright out and remove them when you go into tunnels or poorly lit areas. Use your high and low beams correctly. High beams increase your visibility at night or in tunnels, but they only add glare in fog or smoke. And don't hit other drivers with your high beams. It's unsafe to purposely impair their vision. Headlights improve visibility in a couple different ways. They improve visibility at night, and studies show that other drivers can actually see the bus better when your headlights are on during the day. I understand what high and low beams are for, but what's the difference when you have limited visibility? At night, low beams let you see up to 300 feet, while high beams illuminate a distance up to 500 feet. But don't overdrive your headlights. If you're using your low beams, you have to be going slow enough to see a hazard and stop safely. So make sure you reduce your speed and increase your following distance. While you're using your high beams, maintain a 10 second following distance to prevent your bus from blinding the driver in front of you. If you're following less than 10 seconds behind, only use your low beams. When it comes to oncoming traffic, dim your high beams at a minimum of 500 feet or sooner. That's about 12 bus lengths. And always dim your high beams, even if oncoming drivers don't show you the same courtesy. Never flash your high beams at another driver. Flashing your high beams can temporarily blind that driver, causing them to swerve or maybe worse. A rare weather condition we may find ourselves driving in is high winds. The basic defensive driving countermeasure for all adverse weather is simple. Slow down and increase your following distance. But by how much? Well, the general rule is to increase your following distance one extra second for each additional hazard. This applies not only on slick roads, but also in high winds, as it reduces the sail effect of our large vehicles when driving at highway speeds. This is particularly critical when driving tall vehicles like buses, minivans, turtle tops, cutaways, etc. But it's also a very good and recommended practice when driving pickups and sedans. Slowing down gives you more control and increasing your following distance gives you a much larger safety cushion to your front, as well as giving you more time to react to the mistakes of other motorists. Please slow down and increase your following distance when there are adverse weather conditions, including wind. An accident isn't worth saving a few minutes time and will, at the very least, ruin the day of everyone involved. Besides weather, you can also encounter potential hazards while driving in different settings, such as over drawbridges, on narrow streets, in traffic circles, parking lots, and over mountains. Let's start by talking about drawbridges. When approaching a drawbridge, drive at a rate of speed that will allow you to quickly stop the vehicle before reaching the lip of the draw if necessary. Stop before crossing drawbridges that don't have a signal light or traffic control attendant. Stop at least 50 feet before the draw of the bridge and look to make sure the draw is completely closed before crossing. You should proceed only after assuring yourself that it's safe to cross. 
Now you don't have to stop, but you should slow down and check for safe conditions before proceeding. Even when there's a green traffic light or the, when the bridge has an attendant or traffic officer to control traffic when the bridge opens. Another situation that requires extra caution is driving on narrow streets. When turning onto a narrow street, make sure the vehicle has enough clearance and proceed down the street at 15 miles per hour or less. If you're on a narrow street and another car is coming from the other direction without enough room to pass safely, stop and allow the other vehicle to pass, but whatever you do, do not back up. If needed, ask the other driver to back up. Collisions frequently occur at traffic circles because many drivers don't know who has the right of way and vehicles merge and exit at several points. In the vast majority of circles, the traffic in this circle has the right of way. You should enter a traffic circle only when there's a gap in the traffic, but once in the circle, don't depend on your left side mirror. The curve of the circle places traffic out of sight in the mirror. You need to check traffic through the left side window by turning your head in the direction of traffic. Caution is key when it comes to traffic circles. This is particularly true if there are several lanes. Merge carefully and get into the correct lane. If you can't safely get into your exit lane, then continue around the circle until you can. Besides residential areas and apartment complexes, we occasionally pick up and drop off customers in parking lots, at medical facilities, shopping centers, and other areas that may have obstacles. Obstacles like parking structures, overhead canopies, tree branches, and other hazards won't be visible by just quickly checking the outside mirrors. Mirrors have height restrictions as well as other limitations. For this reason, make sure you move up and down and left to right in your seat when looking in mirrors for objects that are higher than your mirror will show. Your visibility, as well as the visibility of pedestrians and other drivers, may be limited by signs, trees, bushes, or delivery trucks in parking lots. When driving in a parking lot, make sure to drive slowly, be prepared to stop, survey in all directions, use all mirrors, watch for pedestrians in the road, watch for vehicles backing out of parking spaces, double check where visibility is limited, sound your horn to communicate and let them see you, Drive on designated thoroughfares and never cut across aisles and parking spaces. Finally, there's mountain driving. The force of gravity plays a major role in mountain driving. The steeper the grade, the longer the grade, and the heavier the load, the more you'll be required to use lower gears. When going down steep hills, gravity tends to make the vehicle go faster. You must drive at a safe speed by using a lower gear and using proper braking techniques. The gear to select for going down a grade should be no higher than that required for going up the same grade. However, some vehicles may require lower gears going down than going up. For these reasons, it's important for you to get to know your vehicle. Let's review. Rain reduces your traction by up to 55%, so cut your speed by at least 25%. Increase your following distance to at least five seconds and leave more room. Snow reduces your traction up to 75%. Increase your following distance to at least six seconds and reduce your speed by 50%. Ice and sleet are the most dangerous road conditions of all. Your traction is reduced by 85 to 95%, so you've got to reduce your speed by 66%. If you are going 60 miles per hour, you need to bring that down to 20. Also, increase your following distance to at least seven seconds to accommodate the extra distance that's required to stop. And take extra caution to accelerate slowly and brake very gradually. Never use your retarder or engine brake in adverse weather. In heavy fog or smoke, don't use your high beams. They reflect off the vapor and particles and create glare. If your sight distance in these conditions is reduced to two seconds or less, safely pull off the road and wait until conditions improve. No exceptions. When it's hot out, use the fast idle to cool the engine when you're stopped for less than 10 minutes. Use low gears when traveling at less than 40 miles per hour during the hot part of the day. Turn off your engine retarder system when the temperature is above 110 degrees. 
and use your air conditioner. Remember your ability to see is reduced by too much light, such as when you drive into the sun or toward oncoming headlights at night, too little light, like when you're driving at night, and a combination of too much and too little light, like when you drive from a brightly lit area into a dark area. This program has presented the information you need to allow for adverse driving conditions that you'll have to deal with. Remember, snow and ice don't cause accidents. Drivers do. Rain doesn't cause accidents. Drivers do. So slow down and leave plenty of room in front of your bus. Give yourself a minimum of four seconds following distance in normal conditions and at least five to seven seconds in adverse weather. Okay, now we're gonna talk about accidents and incidents. Those reports are due within 24 hours, but if you're involved in an accident, when should you report that? Right away? Absolutely. Okay, so at your location, you may have different types of forms that you utilize if there is an accident or incident while you're transporting the BCPS students, okay? So the most important thing is you're going to call into hopefully your dispatcher, right? Then who do you think they'll notify? Police, the school system, everybody that needs to know because you're transporting our students, right? If it's an emergency situation, are you going to call your dispatch first or 911? 911. Yes. That's pretty much going to be a judgment call, but you're also going to make sure that you call in to dispatch so they can contact the appropriate people, okay? So as we kind of touch base with that, so if there is an accident situation, are the students safer in the vehicle? Yes. Depending on the situation, right? Okay. So again, you're gonna call your dispatch or you can give us a call, it's uh, 443, the 809 4321, and that's basically our BCPS headquarters, okay? So you will also need to provide them with your location, right? And what else? I gave you a cheat sheet. What else would you need to let? Any injuries? Any injuries? How about the schools you're going to? What else? Who's in your vehicle? Who's in the vehicle? Okay. Why do you think that's important? They can make the proper notifications. Absolutely. Make the proper notifications. So we talk about emergency situations. What could be a possible emergency situation as you transport the students to or from school? An allergic reaction. Allergic reaction. Maybe a bee sting. Bee sting. Choking, okay. Anybody else? Seizure. Seizure. Medical related things, okay. So medical emergencies, maybe your vehicle breaks down. That's possible, right? What if there's a fight in your vehicle with the students? What are you gonna do in that situation? What's the first thing you're gonna do? Try to stop the fight. Try to stop the fight? Okay, anybody else? How about pulling over to a safe location? Okay, pull over to a safe location, try to get them calmed down, and the main thing you're gonna tell them to do is what? Stop fighting, right? Pull over to a safe location, and we want to remember that we wanna to try to keep the hands-off approach, okay? Because what could happen if you place your hand on a student? You could get sued. What else? You could harm the child. You could harm the child, right? It could just escalate the situation, right? Okay, so do not place your hands on the students except to protect them in an immediate, immediate emergency. Just remember we always practice safety, 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 right? So, we talk in terms of a fight. So you might have a fight on the on the in the vehicle, okay? So some of those behaviors that may be displayed with the students, 
which may have led to the fight, could be some of the things displayed here, okay? Maybe one, they don't get along with the other student in the vehicle, that's possible. So is there anything that you could do to kind of help with that situation? Two students in the vehicle, you're noticing that they're having issues with riding together. Is there anything that you can do as a driver? Absolutely. Would you notify anybody of that? Issues that you're having as you're transporting the students? You could talk to the parents, talk to the school. Mm-hmm. Anybody else? So something, some, these are some of the behaviors that may be displayed while um, in your vehicle, these students. Some of them may be nonverbal. Do you know what that means by being nonverbal? Can't talk, okay? So can't really communicate verbally what the issue may be, okay? What about inappropriate language? Don't use the words, okay? But <laughs> sometimes a student may just have outbursts with inappropriate language, okay? And then you have the aggression. And then some may be just withdrawn. So another one that we see, it's not often, but we have seen it, where they have poor impulse control, okay? Now, some of these students that have the different, uh, I'm gonna say behavior situations, we may, Lauren will get into this later, but they are placed in equipment, okay? So the one that you may be using in your vehicle will be a safety vest. So if the student comes to your vehicle and they have the safety vest on, you're gonna make sure that the safety vest is actually placed on the student the proper way, okay? So as the student gets, comes to you, they may or may not have the safety vest on, so they walk towards you, placing their hands inside of the safety vest. Once the student turns around, you will then begin to zip Zip the back of the safety vest. Okay, but you want to make sure it fits kind of snug. Not tight, but snug in the back. Then below we have what we call uh, crotch straps. So again, you will have a student facing you. Turn to the side. Grab hold of the strap. You'll have it extended so you're not reaching in their personal space. So it will be extended down low. Reach it behind snap and connect. This one you're reaching below, snap and then correct as well, okay? So then the student will be placed in your vehicle. There is something called a tether strap that will be placed in the, that will be in your vehicle that this would connect to. Now again, this will make more sense if you're out there in your vehicle and a student has one of these. Someone will come out to you and help explain that better and what that will look like. Here, just turn it around just so. So not every student will have a safety vest. This is just another means of having a safer transport with students that may be exhibiting some of these type of behaviors, okay? Because you want them to be in, placed in a least restrictive environment, but you want it to be a safe ride as well, okay? Thank you. So we're gonna talk about some of the factors that may be influencing that behavior that some of the students may display. So the students, what about the fact that they may be hungry or maybe their needs are not met, being met, maybe they're tired, they're bullied, or maybe they're having some concerns or issues with their parents, or maybe they're taking medication, okay? So some factors that influence the parents' behavior, maybe their values, personality, their philosophy, their discipline, work arguments, and lack of sleep. So I'll give you another visual of this. 
So in terms of the behavior, you see the tip of the iceberg, okay? So the tip of the iceberg is basically the behavior that the student is displaying as they travel in your vehicle with you, okay? But what you don't see below that is the values and the needs are not being met. This is a reflection of why the behavior is what it is. Something that we can't see, but the child is ex experiencing this. And in most cases, think about it, children, they don't know how to communicate that the needs aren't being met, okay? They just show it in their behavior that, that, that they're displaying with you or another adult, okay? So what's most importantly to remember about different behaviors that the student may display, how are you going to respond to that? If their behavior is negative or aggressive, how are you going to respond to that as an adult? Can you give me an example? Carefully. Carefully, right? Because if you respond inappropriately, what could happen with you as the driver? you'll have negative consequences, right? Because everything that the behavior that the student has displayed, now it's basically pushed to the side because you responded inappropriately, unprofessionally, and what else? Would that jeopardize your job? Maybe, okay? Because what's our goal again? To provide what? Absolutely. So what you want to do is address behaviors individually. What do you think that means? To me, that means if the student's acting out, um, I'm not going to correct them in front of other students. Right. You know, I, I want to make sure that they have a safe ride, but I'm not going to, you know, do things in front of the other kids that might embarrass them. Absolutely. Absolutely. A lot of times, I th sometimes I think that when you take the audience away, that probably will help the situation, okay? Some students, they like to perform just because they have that audience, right? But again, it's gonna take it back to you figuring out what it is about that student that's causing them to react a certain way. So are you gonna choose your battles with your students? Yes. Because if you don't, you nitpick at every single thing that they do. What happens to your ride? It becomes terrible. Yes. What else? You're going to have a combatant child. You're going to have a child that's you know, going to set yourself up for um, a habit. They mm -hmm. know what to expect. You know, they know there's going to be a confrontation, <coughs> and they're going to set you up for that. Mm-hmm just going to be a miserable ride every day, yep. every morning, every afternoon, because this kid is no, going to buttons. push your buttons yep. and you're going to respond negatively and then it's just going to escalate into a terrible ride. Absolutely. It's going to be a fight for the parents to have them get into your vehicle. That's, that's a good point. Right. Appreciate that. Because if they don't want to ride with you to and from school, then that ends up setting them up for a bad day too. So. Absolutely. Those are all good points. Appreciate that. So we talk about attainable goals for the group. Let's just think about with our little kids. So what would be an attainable goal for them? Let's think about during your transport. If they're always having issues sitting down, keeping their hands off of the windows, what would be an attainable goal with, let's say, a pre-K or kindergarten student? Stickers, yeah. Everybody likes to be rewarded for a good job, right? I do. <laughs> okay. So moving forward, so we talk about management uh, strategies and we talk about behavior. So the main thing you want to focus on is being consistent with everything that you do. Because who's depending on you to be consistent? Parents. 
Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Look forward to that, right? So we talk about positive reinforcement. Can you give me an example of positive reinforcement? So instead of every time you see them doing something negative, when you see them doing something good, like sitting still, keeping their hands to themselves, you say, Sierra, you're doing a great job. Thank you, Miss Jamie. <laughs> It can even be just saying good morning in the morning. Absolutely. So that, I'm going to tie that positive reinforcement into our 5 to 1 ratio. So if you could take a guess, what do you think the 5 to 1 ratio would be? I would say 5 uh, positive things to 1 negative thing. Oh, that's great. How'd you know? Absolutely. So if a kid is always <laughs> hearing negative, negative things they're not doing this they're not doing that that's what they're so used to but now they come to ride in a vehicle with you and you're giving them the complete opposite how do you think that makes that student feel when they see you they're very excited right. yes good. soon as you pull up you know there goes miss jamie there goes miss rebecca they're really excited that's the response that you want the parents to have seen as you pull up to pick up their student versus now I don't I don't want to go with them today or here they come okay so we talk about stating expectations positively so can you give me an example of stating that positive expectation Wow, Tammy, you sat in that chair so well on the way home. I'm so proud of you. You mm -hmm. did a great job. Right, then you get that smiley face that they give you. And then to me, they look for more reasons or ways to get your attention for you to say something nice to them. Okay? So we talk about clean and organized environment. We'll kind of touch base a little bit with that later on. But do you want your vehicle to be clean inside? I hope so. You don't want to have water bottles, candy, soda, chips laying inside of the vehicle as you pick up the student because what happens if they're allergic to whatever it is that's left in the vehicle? They pick it up and eat it. What happens then? Whose fault is it? Yes, right? Because, you know, nowadays, look, people are, they're allergic to different things. But little kids, let's just say, they are curious. So seeing a bright colored piece of candy, m and m Skittles, they pick it up and eat it. Now you have an emergency situation, right? Keep it clean. So when we talk about first impressions, do you have the opportunity to make a great first impression when you pick up your student? Yes. Absolutely. Okay. So Rebecca's going to get into this a little bit more about first impressions. Hey, my name is Rebecca, and I'm one of the other trainers here at BCPS um, Schools. And um, as Sierra had said, I'm going to go over positive beginnings. What does that mean to everyone, positive beginnings? Make a good start to your day? Absolutely. So when we think about um, these children and parents, um, you're given a route and you're meeting the children and the parents for the very first time. And as a parent, um, you're afraid. You're afraid because, you know, you've never met this person before. They pull up to your house and your child is clinging to your leg and saying, mommy, that's a stranger, I don't know, I don't feel comfortable, you know, what have you. The first impression that you're going to make, you know, as Sierra had said earlier, first impressions are most important. You're going to say, hi, how are you? My name is John, my name is Tammy, my name is, you know, whatever. Um, welcome, you know, you're going to make that positive connection with that child and with the parents because um, it's really important that you make that connection. Think of how you would feel meeting someone for the first time. Just very nervous. So you want to make sure that 
first impression is a positive one because that child wants to be able to come back to you every day. And the parent wants to feel comfortable putting their child in your car for that safe, efficient car ride. You always want to think about the student. You always want to think about that student who is riding with you. Think about that happy face. That's what you want every time that you drop that child off in the afternoon with their parent. Bye, Miss Tammy. Bye, Miss Sierra. Have a great day. Think about the different things that they would feel when they're getting into your vehicle. They have separation anxiety. Think about how small they may be. You know, they might be a kindergartner. They may have a hard time um, navigating their way to get into the vehicle. You have small children that fall asleep easily. Communication, when you're communicating with a child, you want to make sure that it is clear and concise communication. Can you give me some examples of clear communication? Just sit down. Have a seat. Can you, can you, can you climb into my, into my car? Can you put your foot up there and enter? Um, they're kids. Just think about, you know, they are kids. They have a short attention span. And positive reinforcement goes a very long way. What are some examples of positive reinforcement? I know that Sierra had talked about that earlier. Maybe playing their music in the car? As a reward? Mm hmm What are some other positive reinforcements? You got a nice haircut. Absolutely, just noticing them, right? Yeah. Noticing them. Wow, I really love those shoes. Those shoes are amazing, right? Thank you. It makes that face just brighten up in the afternoon or in the morning when they first come into you. You know, maybe they're tired and, and they're coming into, um, you know, into your car and they're like, oh God, I'm really tired. I don't feel like going to school. And you look at them and you say, wow, Sierra, those are, that's a beautiful shirt you have on today. And they just look at you and like, oh, well, thank you. And they just kind of like perk up a little bit. And it also makes the parents feel really comfortable that their child is getting into, you know, your car and, you know, they're happy about being there. In the afternoon when they're leaving, make sure it's a positive ending. The same as you begin the day, you want to end the day. You want to end it positively. So the next day when they come in, they want to be able to get into your car. They're like, wow, I did this, that, and the other last night because you want everything to be positive. Say goodbye. See you tomorrow. Thank you for doing such a good job in driving home. Enjoy your day. Does that make sense? Yes. So sleeping children, um, you guys are going to be having a monitor. So most of the time you won't leave the child alone. But what happens if your child has to go to the bathroom? What, what are you going to do then? Take them to McDonald's. Absolutely not. <laughs> Absolutely not. So um, you would either take them to one of the many BCPS locations, any of the schools. Um, you could take them to the police department. You could take them to the fire department. You could take them to PALS locations, which are normally in the afternoon and they're located behind elementary schools. But you, yes? What's a PAL? It's a physical, wait a minute. Isn't it a police? Athletic league. Athletic. Yes, it's the police athletic league. Um, but they're only open on the afternoons and they're normally located in the back of elementary schools. So you would most likely want to take them to one of our Baltimore County Public School locations. That would be the safest location. Never want to go to a Walmart or to a Target or to a McDonald's or any of those other loca locations if you want to still work for Baltimore County Public Schools. I guess it's not safe taking them outside. No, it's not safe. And you want to make sure that you 
CYA, cover your assets. Make sure that you are protected at all times. Make sure that the child is protected at all times. If um, you're going into a school, you want to ask the school, is there an open bathroom, a clear open bathroom that they can go into? Do you have to call in to let them know that you want to take them to the bathroom? Do you have to tell somebody that? That's a really good question. Yes. Yes, you would. So now we're going to talk about students with disabilities, which within Baltimore County Public Schools, we do work a lot with students that have individual disabilities. So moving forward, obviously we want to handle these students with care, which is why we have the sign here saying fragile handle with care. So going into that, the legal framework leading into um, disabilities and handling students with disabilities. The first one we talk about is the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, which prohibits discrimination on the basis of disability in programs. Um, Section 504 of that act prohibits organizations that receive federal money from discriminating against a person on the basis of disability. So the way that this relates to the school system is that um, we can't deny them a sort of education because of these legal frameworks. Um, an IDEA, or the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act of 1975, established the Education for All Handicapped Children Act, which guarantees a free appropriate public education to each child with a disability. What that means is, is that we have to offer each child their um, educational program regardless of what what different disability they have. Um, each student usually has an individualized education plan. Um, their disability, they will come together as a team. Their parents, their teachers, their administrators within the school, anybody that works with them will come together and come up with an individualized education plan that helps them throughout their um, school day as far as what they're supposed to have set in place. So we'll go more into that as we talk about the different disabilities. Um, transportation as a related service, not every child that has an IEP will be having special transportation. Um, sometimes transportation as a related service becomes into the IEP when we have to maybe take them to a different school because we're providing them that um, education outside of our system because we need to, or because maybe we don't have it within our system, so we send them to what we call a non-public school. Um, or maybe it could be that they require special equipment or they need a special length of ride because of their disability. Identification requirements, um, we have to go through different identification requirements with each um, special needs student as far as what we go through process-wise to identify what different things they need related to their education with their disabilities, which obviously our teachers and anybody within our system are given appropriate training to help with working with these students. Early intervention, we've discovered, is one of the biggest things as far as working with students with disabilities. So when they come in to us, we may not know they have a disability. So as things progress within their education or even in their transportation, the things that we notice and tell the school and the things that the school notices helps them to come up with what they need for their individualized education plan. Um, with the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990, which you'll more commonly hear referenced as the ADA. Uh, it's a civil law that prohibits discrimination based on disability. So how that would relate would be maybe you have a student that maybe doesn't have a mental handicap, but maybe they have a physical handicap. So when they go to a school, the school has to create 
whatever needs to be created in order to get them into the generalized population. So that may be as far as adding a ramp into a school. But these things help each student get their fair education. And finally, the McKinney-Vento Act is our Homeless Assistant Act of 1987, which ensures educational rights and protections for homeless children and youth. It's basically our no child left behind. So when you have children that are homeless, we will transport them to their school of origin. So if for, have, heaven forbid somebody were to lose their home mid-school year, we would continue to transport them to their home school to give them that um, continual um, education where they've been. So that even if while they're going through everything that they're going through homeless-wise, at least that is their consistency that we're providing them. So moving forward, you want to get to know your students. So you want to talk with them, talk with their parents, talk with their teachers. Anybody's a resource. Um, when you know that you have students with disabilities, sometimes it's worth it to ask the parents, what can I do in these situations? How can I best interact with your student? Use your resources, ask questions. So who might be resources that you ask for? Mm -hmm. parents. parents definitely um, sometimes even ask the kids they may have a disability but that doesn't necessarily mean that they don't know what works for them too they may be willing to tell you hey I need to be focused on something uh, medical information and diagnoses sometimes that's given to us sometimes not um, your school nurses and again your teachers are a good resource for that parents as well um, sometimes that medical information as far as their disability can help you as far as knowing what their needs are as you're transporting them. Talk with the physical therapists at the school, the school nurse, the teacher, um, adult assistants, parents or caregivers, and students. So those are examples of all the people that you can talk to as resources to get to know your students so that you know how to best deal with them on a daily basis. So one of the things that you will see with disabilities is that sometimes students just have a learning disability. Their disabilities aren't always on the outside. Sometimes it's just on the inside. So Students with a learning disability often have difficulty understanding spoken or written language. So you may ask them to read a sign that says stop as you're going along and they may not be able to read it. That might be part of their learning disability. They may have inability or difficulty listening, reasoning, speaking, reading, writing, spelling, or doing math. These things are all things that typically show more in the school day, but in transporting students with learning disabilities, they may come to you with some of these problems. Maybe they are having trouble reading a book and because they see you every day, they might ask the person that's in the vehicle with them, you know, I, I'm, I'm working on this, can you help me? So that's something that more often with a learning disability, they may come to you for advice or for help. So autism, that's another disability that our students often have. According to the Autism Society, more than 3.5 million Americans live with an autism spectrum disorder. The prevalence of autism in the U.S. children has increased by 119% from 2000 to 2010. Autism is the fastest growing developmental disability. The Autism Society defines autism spectrum disorder as a complex developmental disability. Signs typically appear during early childhood and affect a person's ability to communicate and interact with others. That's why this early intervention is very important because oftentimes when we catch it early enough, then they can know what they need to do to help the students learn what they need to do to survive once they do graduate from school. 
a range of conditions characterized by difficulties in the areas of, areas of social skills, repetitive unusual behaviors, and communication. Um, so a lot of times a student with autism may not stare at you and, or make eye contact with you when they speak with you. They may flap their hands or do like click their fingers or make noises repeatedly because it helps to calm them down. And their communication, they may not communicate with you as much depending on where they land on the spectrum. They may look away when they talk to you on the higher end or maybe on the lower end they may not communicate at all. Students with autism often have trouble with social skills. So a lot of times they may not understand nonverbal communication. So what we mean by that is that maybe you could be upset with them, maybe they're doing something they're not supposed to be doing, and they're not gonna understand your body language where you cross your arms and stare at them or give them the eye from the rear view mirror like you would like to do with your children in the car perhaps. But they don't understand that. You're gonna look at them, say something, or, or not say something, or give them the look, and they're not going to understand what you mean by that. It may just completely go over their heads. Uh, body language, again, facial expressions, they don't understand as much. They will avoid eye contact. That is one of the main things of autism. It makes them feel uncomfortable, so they won't make eye contact with you when you talk to them or even when you're trying to get their attention while they're doing something, they won't make eye contact with you. They avoid social contact with other students. So if you have another student in the car that you're transporting at the same time, they may not interact with them at all. Um, they have, and because they avoid these social contacts, they have difficulty with friendships and they have difficulty understanding what others are thinking and feeling. So an example of this would be a student may have, you may have that they may just blurt out things to you. For instance, they may look at you and say, oh, you know what? You're kind of fat, but you're really nice. I like you. So these are things that they may not understand that that might have made you upset that they called you fat. But at the same time, they're trying to express what they're seeing and what they're feeling. So these are things that may come about with a student that has autism. So again, that's talking about autism spectrum disorder. Moving on with ADD and ADHD, we have a lot of students that may um, appear like they do not have a disability, but ADD and ADHD oftentimes don't present themselves as a typical uh, disability, what people may think. So a student with ADD or ADHD may have impulsive actions. They have short attention spans. And again, because students with ADHD do not show physical signs, it's easy to confuse the disability with being bad. So you may be going down the road, see something along the side, and all of a sudden they want to put down the window and start yelling out the window at somebody. That is an impulsive act that may be characteristic of a student that you have riding with you that has ADHD or ADD. Or maybe if you're trying to have a conversation with them, they may not know what they may know what you're saying, but their attention span is short enough that they're not getting all the pieces of it. So um, when you give directions to students with ADD, ADHD, you want to make sure that they are short, concise, and to the point. Moving along to first aid, your best resource besides the parents is your school nurses. They will give you school-based resources. Um, they will discuss with you and with drivers and monitors about a first aid plan for students with health concerns early in the year. So if your student has issues because of diabetes or allergy related things, this would be the person who would come to you and give you that information typically with a sheet that tells you everything that you need to look for. 
If you have a question, you are also able to call our Office of Health Services as a resource, which the number is listed here on the PowerPoint. Um, but again, it's 443-809-6368. If you have a question on how to deal with certain things with a student with a health concern, once it's given to you, you can always call and ask them if you don't feel as though you got enough information from the school nurse. So first aid is rendered to save a life or sustain life until medical help arrives. It's rendered to prevent an injury from becoming worse and rendered to relieve pain. Now, when we say relieve pain, we don't mean just handing them Tylenol because you happen to have it in your glove compartment. What we mean is that you want to try and help them contain whatever's going on. So, for example, if you have a situation where a student cut themselves by accident and they're bleeding, you want to talk them through what it is that needs to be done in order to contain that cut. You want to go through all the steps with that so that it can help them contain it. If they are unable to do it, that is when you would make sure that you use your universal precautions, which is your gloves, your um, protective gear, and make sure that you are helping them only in a way that needs to be done, like helping to apply pressure to a wound with it covered. Um, and with relieving pain, talk them through what they could do to help relieve the pain that they're going through. An example that we would walk through is choking. This is one of the many reasons why you don't want to give out candy or anything until they are getting out of your vehicle. Um, try to discourage them eating in your vehicle because choking is a very real hazard. So symptoms of choking, a person will usually grab their neck or grasp at it. A person will not be able to speak. The person's cough will become weaker or the person will be unable to cough and the person's face may change colors. If a person is actively choking, then all those things will be happening. If the victim can talk, cough, or cry, they are able to breathe. So don't interfere and just encourage them to continue coughing to try to dislodge whatever is in their throat. Have Again, so have the victim continue to cough until the object is dislodged. Seizures. So if a student has a seizure, you want to pull over to a safe location. You want to protect the student's head and body from potential injury. You never want to place anything in the student's mouth because that then becomes a choking hazard and you want to allow the student's seizure to run its course, but if the seizure lasts more than five minutes or if it is a first time seizure, call 911. So we do have students that oftentimes are predisposed to seizures. So when that is something that occurs frequently and the school knows about it or it's a potential that it might occur, they oftentimes will come out and give you a sheet as to what steps you need to take if they have a seizure. So if it is a student that has it quite often, you may get a paper that says it's normal for it to last about a minute. If it lasts longer than a minute, then you would call 911. Or um, it'll tell you it's normal for them to last a minute. So you don't need to call 911, just make sure that they're safe and let the parent and the school know when it's happened because it happens frequently. If you don't have any seizure protocol, treat it as a first time seizure and call 911 just to make sure that you are on the safe side because ultimately we are worried about the safety of our students and we can only work with the information we are given. Bleeding. So if you have a student that gets a cut or something on their arms or their legs, you want to apply direct pressure if bleeding is severe, apply pressure to the pressure points in the arm and the leg. If dressing becomes soaked, apply additional dressing without removing the initial dressing. So what you want to do is keep that gauze pad or whatever it was that you put over top of it there and just keep layering on top while you're applying pressure. 
elevate the wound above the heart. So if it's their arm, you wanna take their arm and hold it up above their head. Hold it up as high as you can, get them to do it. If they can't do it, that's when you step in and help them along with it. And do not attempt to make tourniquets unless you have been trained. And this is not a formal training. That's only if you have maybe the Red Cross Life Saving course, but don't attempt to make a tourniquet unless you are formally trained. Nosebleeds. So with a nosebleed, you would want to pinch the soft part of the nose where you feel the cartilage. Underneath the cartilage, you want to pinch that soft part. Encourage them to lean their heads forward so their chin touches their chest. And you want to keep the students in a seated position. Why do you think that you wouldn't want your student to lean their head back while their nose is bleeding? They definitely could choke. Definitely. And thinking about the way that our noses and our throats and the esophagus and everything are just all connected, if you tilt the head back, that's also a risk of aspirating some of the blood down into their lungs. So you definitely want to make sure that their nose is bent, their head is bent forward so the bleeding comes more towards the outside of their nose and it becomes contained. Asthma. Oftentimes students that have asthma will already have some inhaler that they carry with them or they will have some sort of rescue apparatus with them that they keep in their book bag. Um, and usually this will be disclosed to you if they have asthma, usually by the parent or by the school. A student with asthma, when they start having problems, will often start coughing. The airways will become narrow and swollen. They'll have trouble breathing. They will become fearful and anxious, which you can see in their face because obviously your eyes get big, your face goes red, and you get scared. You'll hear wheezing. Their pulse will become rapid. Their skin, again, will become flushed or red. They may become sweating and begin hunching over in a forward position. Assisting a student with asthma, a lot of times, again, they carry a self-carry medication inhaler. So if they have one in their book bag, you want to encourage them to take it out or help them find it in their book bag. And um, you want to help them through the steps of using it. If you know that they're small and they need to be talked through the steps, then talk them through the steps. For students in severe respiratory distress, you need to call 911 because in situations like this, again, every second counts. and do not allow students to share their asthma medication. So if you know a student has asthma and they have that rescue inhaler in their book bag, you want to make sure that unless they're having an asthma attack or an issue with their breathing, that they are keeping their inhaler in their book bag at all times because another student may steal it and try to use it for recreational purposes, which we do not need. Students with diabetes, which is high blood sugar, it's, diabetes is a disorder in which the body can't change foods properly into energy needed for daily activity. Insulin is needed to convert sugars, starches, carbohydra and carbohydrates into glucose. And people with diabetes do not produce enough insulin to change food into glucose. So this is something that oftentimes, again, will be and information given to you by the nurse. Signs of low blood sugar, which typically is what they look for more often in students, is that you'll see um, behavioral changes. They'll become disoriented, maybe confused. They may become very sleepy. So if you see a student that oftentimes when they come out to your vehicle in the afternoon or maybe even in the morning and they're usually very up and all of a sudden 
on that ride, they become very sleepy, kind of lethargic. That's where you may want to consider that their blood sugar has dropped and become a bit too low. Their speech may become slurred. They may become very shaky and unsteady when they're walking. And at the very worst case scenario, they would go into a coma, which is what we want to prevent. So emergency care for a diabetic student, which oftentimes will be relayed to you again by the school nurse, by the parent, but more often the school nurse will give you a sheet that actually tells you what you need to do in case there's something that's happening with the student. You, low blood sugar is a medical emergency. So again, the school nurse will review with, your, with you your role and actions if a child with diabetes is in your vehicle. And when in doubt, always give sugar. So sometimes the nurse will hand you a packet of Skittles and tell you if this person is having, all of a sudden becomes very sleepy and tired, it's usually a sign of their blood sugar dropping. So you want to give them this packet of Skittles and wait until they pep up a little bit. It'll help to get their blood sugar up. Or maybe mom has an emergency little bottle of glucose tabs in their book bag. And mom and the nurse tell you the glucose tabs are in their book bag. If they're having an issue, like they get very shaky all of a sudden, encourage them to take one of their glucose tabs. These things will be told to you by the nurse and most likely also by the parent if you have a diabetic student. Students exposed to allergens. So if a victim was exposed to an allergen but shows no sign of a severe allergic reaction, you want to monitor the student for the rest of the route and notify the school nurse or parent upon arrival. So an example of this would be if you had a student, two students in your vehicle, one that you know has a peanut allergy and another one that doesn't. You may want to ask the student that doesn't have the peanut allergy to keep their lunch and everything away, but sometimes when you're driving, you can't stop them from pulling out that peanut butter and jelly sandwich. So they may have pulled out that sandwich and eaten it next to the kid with the peanut allergy, and all of a sudden, that's an exposure. So if you know that they've been exposed to that and they've been in the same vehicle with it, you just want to monitor them until they get there safely. If they're not having a reaction to it, then maybe that's not bothering them, but you still want to let the school nurse or the parent know so that they can react and know whether they may have to react more drastically once something happens or if something happens. What we want to prevent is anaphylaxis. So reactions include swelling of lips, throat, and or tongue breathing problems, so a hoarse voice, coughing, wheezing, shortness of breath. They may become very pale, have a weak pulse, or possibly faint. They may break out in a rash everywhere and may begin vomiting. Anaphylaxis is basically the reaction once they have a severe reaction to an, alert, an allergy that they have. So a lot of times when a student has some sort of an allergic or some sort of an allergy and it's known that they have allergic reactions to things, they often carry an epinephrine pen or an epinephrine auto injector. So this is what you would have to do to administer it. You would want to pull off the blue safety release at the end. You would want to place the orange tip on the thigh at a right angle to the leg. You want to always give in the outside of the mid thigh. You don't want to have it all the way up on, your, on their hip or down by their knee. You want to have it somewhere nice and in between. Um, and it may be administered through clothing. Then you want to press firmly into the thigh until the auto injector mechanism clicks and hold it in place for three seconds. Once it's administered, you want to remove the injector and put it in a safe place until EMS can dispose of it. And you want to massage the injection area or 
try to get the student to massage the injection area. If you need to assist, again, use your universal precautions, your gloves and things, and help to massage that area. The most important thing about an EpiPen or an epinephrine pen is that you never want to touch the orange tip of the EpiPen. It gives that rush of epinephrine to your system and for somebody that's not going through anaphylaxis, that can be detrimental. After administering the EpiPen, you always want to call 911. The student must go to the hospital even if they seem better. So once they have that EpiPen, they may start to act and feel normal. You still want to send them to the hospital. You want to call your dispatch and you would want to call um, into Baltimore County just to let them know that 911 has been called because of this situation. They can inform the school, the nurses at the school, if you're headed into school, they can inform the parents and let them know that this has happened so that they can go to the hospital with their child. And you'll want to stay with the student and keep them calm until help arrives to take them to the hospital. Again, I've said it a couple times, your universal precautions. So with this, when you have you think of universal precautions, even though you may know a lot about that student, we still want to treat it as everybody is infectious. So when you think of universal precautions, you just take these precautions no matter what. So what you want to do is protect yourself. You want to treat all blood and body fluids from all persons as if the person was infectious. You want to use gloves and other barriers whenever blood, body fluids, or broken skin is present. And report all exposures to your supervisor and the Office of Health Services immediately following the event. So even though you may have been around the student all the time. We don't know what they're carrying. So if you are exposed to their blood or their bodily fluids in any way, shape, or form, you want to report it immediately so that they can get you help just in case you may have been exposed to something. So moving forward, um, all BCPS or Baltimore County Public Schools locations are tobacco free. There's no smoking on bus lots, on school property, or on any school board property. So, like we like to say in class, if you inhale it, you can't exhale it until you are off school property. That also includes in vehicles on school property, and especially not while you have a student in the vehicle with you. Driving a vehicle with students on board, we always want to make sure that we have our first aid kits, body fluid cleanup kits. Um, we want to make sure we have a fire extinguisher just in case something were to happen. You always want to be safe as far as your extinguisher and you want it to be fully charged. In addition, you also want to have seat belt cutters, which would be those blue things up there. They become very helpful just in case something were to happen and you're having trouble getting the seat belt undone. Sometimes it's easier just to hold it at an angle and cut straight up to get them out of that seat. So these are things that you want to make sure that you have when you are going to be driving students in your vehicle. And Did anybody have any other questions? Okay, thank you for coming through our training for Baltimore County Public Schools. Thank you so much for caring and taking care of our students on a daily basis, keeping in mind their safety, their security, and again, thank you for working with BCPS.